I feel most alive when I feel like I'm understanding someone else's story or sharing my story with them. You know, that's when I feel like life is most worth living. Hey, folks, Brian Smith here with Dream Path Podcast, where we get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. Today, we talk to Amber Seeley. Amber is a writer, a producer, and a director. She hails from England and also Santa Fe, New Mexico, but is based in Los Angeles now. And she is a feature film director. She's directed No Light and No Land Anywhere, which I watched to prepare for this interview. Great film. Uh, but the, what we're here to talk about in this interview is her most recent film, No Man of God, starring Elijah Wood, Luke Kirby, and Robert Patrick. This film covers the last four years of Ted Bundy's life, and it's a real-life relationship that occurred, a friendship that developed, actually, between Special Agent Bill Hagmeyer and Ted Bundy in prison while he was waiting to be executed and appealing and uh, doing all of the things that uh, uh, death row inmates do as they're waiting to be executed. Uh, but this relationship developed because Bill... Hagmeyer, Special Agent Hagmeyer, needed to find out where literally the bodies were buried. And um, so it took four years to do, but ultimately uh, Ted Bundy would confess to 30 murders of women and girls. And uh, it's a, a fascinating study on a, a, re a very complicated relationship that unfolded over a period of years. And um, it's really something new and fresh. And I didn't think that was possible to do with a Ted Bundy film because this has been covered in documentaries and other narrative films, including a Zac Efron movie that I, I saw a couple of years ago that came out of Sundance. Uh, but it was done really well. And it stands on its own, even not as a Ted Bundy movie. But if you, if you know nothing about Ted Bundy going into this film... Uh, you can still watch it, and it holds up on its own as a relationship movie. It's a, a very complicated relationship, but um, Elijah Wood produced this film, and he stars as uh, Agent Hagmeyer and Luke Kirby. I, I mean, talk about Oscar-winning performances. Both Elijah and Luke just hit it out of the park here. But Luke Kirby really encapsulates... Uh, or captures the essence of Ted Bundy with this um, this role. And I was riveted the entire time. I think it's about an hour and a half long. It's a pretty tight, efficient film. And I really do think that there are Oscar-worthy performances here and hopefully a Best Director nod uh, when nomination season comes around. So I hope you enjoy my chat with Amber Seeley as much as I did. She talks about creativity. Uh, making her way into film, women in film, the barriers that women face getting into film and working in the film industry. Uh, so we go well beyond just No Man of God, even though we talk a lot about that subject, obviously, because that's what they're uh, promoting right now with the launch of this film. You can check it out on um, Apple uh, streaming or Amazon or wherever you get your video on demand films. It's there to purchase. And I'm sure within a couple of months, it'll be ready to rent. So without further ado, let's jump into my chat with the immensely talented Amber Seeley. Amber Seeley, welcome to Dream Path Podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. So we're here to talk about a pretty special film that I've seen, uh, No Man of God. And, um, for the benefit of my listeners, rather than me describing this film, um, can you give us, you know, your nutshell version of what this film is about and why it is different and um, important to see uh, versus all of the other work that's out there on Ted Bundy and, you know, documentary and narrative and otherwise? Oh, okay. That's a good question. I mean, part of me, it's like, I want you to describe it because I love hearing, <laughs> that's my favorite thing is hearing other people describe my films, but I'm going to try. Let's see. Um, well, first of all, it's about Bill Hagmeyer, who is a real life um, FBI profiler and uh, Ted Bundy, who we all know. And it's about the friendship uh, that the two 
of them formed when Bill was first starting out being an FBI profiler. And he went to the Florida State Prison to interview Bundy to try to, they were some of the first profilers in the world when Reagan started the, the part of the FBI that, that handles profilers. Um, and so he went to interview Bundy to try to understand the serial killer mindset with the hopes that they could then, you know, stop future crimes from happening. Um, so it's essentially about their friendship, their relationship, and the impact that sitting and talking to Ted Bundy had on Bill had on his own sense of, um, I guess you could say morality or his own conscience. Um, and it also asks the kind of larger question of us, the audience, which is um, why are we so interested in Bundy? And why do we know Bundy's name and not the victim's names? And why do we continue to make movies about Bundy? And by the way, I'm as guilty as the next person for that, right? right. Um, so why is it different to, you know, why is it different to other Bundy films, you know, or how is it different? Um, you know, I can't, I guess, totally answer that question. All I know is that for me, uh, when I read the script, you know, my first, before I had read it, my first thought was like another Bundy movie. Like what do we, does the world need another Bundy movie and me direct a Bundy movie? You know, if you're familiar with my work, I'm not a natural fit. You wouldn't, no one that I know of would have assumed, oh yeah, an Amber Seeley Bundy film. Um, but then when I read it, I thought, I actually have something to say about this. Like I had a reaction to the script and I felt like there was a kind of, and a new piece of information. Mm -hmm. One of those was that felt like my interpretation of Bundy, I hadn't seen, and the other Bundy films that came before mine are excellent. You know, this is not, not to disparage them, but I hadn't seen an interpretation of Bundy that to me felt like how I saw him. So that I felt like I wanted that to be, you know, to be kind of part of the narrative or the canon of films on Bundy. Um, but I also, and this kind of leads to your last question about why why is it important. I also felt like there was a whole piece of the equation missing in in you know the other Bundy films. And again, this is not to disparage them. It's just that you know it's just my piece that I felt like was important to add, which is that um, the story is not only Bundy's. It's also the it's also kind of very much in the women's you know a woman's experience. Mm -hmm. Every woman I know knows what it's like to walk down a dark alley hear footsteps behind you and get scared. We are all trained when we go off to college to get mace, to get hold keys in our hand with the key sticking out so we can, you know, stab someone if we have to, you know, we all know that our bodies can be at risk. Um, and so to me, that's a part of this narrative. And so it was important to me to infuse the film with these kind of silent women who are both looking at Bill and looking at Bundy and kind of not only having to experience the listening to what they are saying and what they're doing, but also essentially looking at us and asking, why are you so interested in this? Mm. You know, mm. and I'm yeah. as guilty of that as the next person, you know, like uh, um, it, it's, it's complicated. I guess I think that two things can exist at the same time. One, it can be wrong that there are so many Bundy movies and there, that, that there, and it can be true that there are too many. And it could also be true that there needed to be one more, this one, and that I had something to say and something new to add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a really complicated it's a complicated issue, and I don't I don't know that I have the answer, but I um, I like asking those questions. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it, what I like about the film is that it stands alone on its own, even if you have no understanding of the history of Ted Bundy. Um, mm -hmm. If you're you know a, a twenty something or even a teenager and you like the concept of watching a relationship develop over time between mm -hmm. two diametrically opposed people. You've got this devout Catholic and uh, I, I assume he's Catholic, but you know, he's got the cross dangling from mm -hmm. his uh, rear view mirror and he prays every yeah. morning. That's Elijah Wood's character. And then yeah. uh, Luke Kirby, who just perfectly encapsulated the essence of Ted Bundy. Um, and not yeah. just Ted Bundy, but just this, this, the sinister, the way he looks down and just kind of looks up and the, yeah, he's the, got he, those mannerisms down. Yeah. He, he to me, I mean, I'm oh. definitely by, I think he's the best Bundy. <laughs> oh yeah. And I, I saw the Zac Efron Bundy. I thought he did a great job. And, um, I actually had dinner with uh, Joe Berlinger at uh, Sundance a couple of years ago and, and talked to oh. him about that film, but yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a different film. And what, what you've done with this movie is you've made a standalone. It just holds up completely on its own as a relationship 
a friendship evolving over time that's extremely complicated. And at the end, you're left with um, the, the, this is what I love about film. It's, you know, it leaves you with an uneasy feeling of this duality of man thing where, you know, we're all capable of good and evil. And I think Ted Bundy or, or uh, Luke Kirby's, you know, character did a great job of making Elijah Wood's character, Bill Hegmeyer, understand how mm-hmm. close human beings are to each other, even though one has committed a horrific crime, one has not. There's there's commonality there that you were exploring. And yeah. um, I, w- I was just riveted by it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, that good and evil exists in all of us, quite simply, and that we all have to constantly make choices. Um, you know, we can we can decide to forgive the person who cuts us off on the freeway. We can decide to be kind to the person who's annoying and talking to us in the supermarket. Or, you know, like we have to constantly make choices. Um, and And I at least try to uh, and I'm not saying I'm successful at this, but I try to constantly like approach things from a space of um, love and understanding. Um, and I think that, you know, certainly a part of what I loved about the film was the kind of mental sword play that the two of them are, you know, like they definitely form a friendship. They definitely had a um, love is not quite the right word, but they, they had a love for each other. Um, so, you know, that's true, but they also were both performing for each other. They both wanted something else from each other. Mm-hmm. So to me, that was so interesting. And, you know, as you watch, as you said, you know, it can stay, it's a relationship that that develops and, and you can, even if you're not very interested in Bundy, you can be interested in watching that, how the relationship develops, the child of trust forms and mm-hmm. um, how they annoy each other or get close to each other. Um and that was always really interesting to me was like the, you know, well, what are they saying to each other? And then what do they really want from each other? What's underneath that? And despite, um, you know, them having these kind of ulterior motives, a trust and a friendship was formed. And even Bill Hagmeyer himself would say at the end, you know, yeah, I was friends with him. And Bundy thought Bill was his best friend. And he tried to will all of his earthly possessions to Bill at the end of his life. He wanted to. And Bill actually refused and said he didn't he didn't want them. But, you know, when you ask Bill you know, were you friends with him? You say, yeah, you know, we were friends. And I think he should have died earlier. I think they should have, you know, put him to the chair earlier. Um, So I think it's, you know, that's kind of what I love about the film is that all of these different things can exist at the same time, both on a micro scale and a macro scale, right? So Mm -hmm. we can be good and evil at the same time. And that, you know, grows up into, it can be wrong that we make more Bundy movies and it can be right that we make more Bundy movies. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, it's this grain of like, the duality of things and how that kind of grows exponentially, um, you know, uh, in terms of when you talk about anything to do with the film, that really fascinates me. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, yeah, we are all capable of good and evil. And, and um, I think that's not to say that Bundy is not a psychopath because I do believe that he is a psychopath. And I think there was something just wrong with his brain. Mm -hmm. Um, That said, um, I think that when Bill says, you know, Bill really said to Bundy, you know, yeah, I could kill someone, you know, I think Bill, I think he meant that he could, if he had to. And I, I, I am personally against the death penalty. I I don't support the death penalty. And yet if someone hurt my child, I might go and kill them myself. You know? So it's like, we're all capable of these conflicting Mm -hmm. ideologies, I guess. Yeah. Humans are walking contradictions (laughs) and uh, we've, you know, you've you've done a really great job of of capturing that concept on film, and also distinguishing this film from other films, like specifically Berlinger's narrative film and his documentary, which are very plot driven. Um, and then this happens, and that happens, and you know, you're you're seeing Bundy um, go from, you know, he goes to jail, and then he escapes from jail, and there's not a relationship that's being examined necessarily in those movies. And that's what I I love about no man of God is it's just like a constant study of this relationship and in a, you know, in a, my dinner with Andre sort of (laughs) format. (laughs) One of our producers, Daniel Noah, who I love, he, he, when I kind of pitched him my concept, he was like, 
it's like if Terrence Malick made my dinner with Andre and I was like, yeah, that's, that's it. That really was kind of what I was going for. Um, but you know, it, you're, you're totally right. I mean, I love that you said you think it's, it can stand alone from the sort of normal Bundy true crime stuff. Cause that was very much what I wanted to do. You know, I am not, it's not that I'm not a true crime fan, but like, I'm not entrenched in that genre. I watch some of the true crime stuff that comes out, but not all of it. I'm, I'm not a person that watches every single one and is really clued into like all of that genre stuff and horror stuff and thriller stuff. You know, I see some, but not a lot. And I really like that. I don't know if this is weird, but I like that I was kind of an outsider to it. I felt like I was like, well, Hey, what about people who are not super interested in Bundy? Like what would that person, what movie would they make? And this is what that is, you know? So I hope that the movie appeals to people who are not only, um, you know, it, people who are interested in true crime and interested in Bundy. That's that, that was my my attempt was like, you know, that the movie would be a movie that stood alone as a piece of art separate mm. from it being about who it's about, because yeah. it's also about good and evil. Uh, you know, what is it like to sit so close to evil? Um, how do our choices affect other people? Does God exist? What does believing in God mean? You know, so it's it's also about all of those uh, very universal themes. It's not just about Bundy. And I would in fact, even argue that it's more a Bill Hagmeyer movie than it is a Ted Bundy movie. Yeah. I think you're right because when, you know, it, it's obviously fascinating to watch Luke Kirby encapsulate yeah. Ted Bundy in the way that he did, but to see the innocence, this, the juxtaposition between um, Luke Kirby and Elijah and Elijah being this very earnest um innocent guy who comes in almost with zero judgment mm. about him. I mean, he, he intentionally is not imposing any sort of judgment on Bundy for a purpose, not yeah. because he approves of what, what he did, but because he has an agenda and it's to understand. And uh, yeah. I, I think that just shows this level of sophistication and, um, you know, a very evolved human being that, that Hagmar was. Um, and obviously he made it through the ranks and became, you know, a, a very high ranking official because of that and his brilliance in that way. Um, now yeah. in terms of the, the casting were Elijah and Luke already cast by the time you were attached to the film to direct. No. So Elijah was Elijah, uh, you know, it's his, uh, he's a partner in the production company, Spectre Vision. So okay. he, they had been trying to make the movie for about, I don't know, four or five years before I had come on. Um, and at some point, Elijah decided that he was really interested in Bill's journey and in that character. And I was really so when I came on, he was already attached. And I was thrilled with that because I've always been a fan of Elijah's. And and Elijah has a natural empathy and, like you said, a lack of judgment and a kindness to him. And that's a similar thing that Bill has. And so I thought this is really interesting casting, you know, and, and also who wouldn't want to sit across from those big blue eyes. And I mean, I, you know, you sit across them, you want to tell them everything. Right. So I could see, <laughs> and Bill had that kind of um, thing where you sit opposite him and you just want to tell him everything. He's very warm and um, just, he invites you to, to share with him. And mm -hmm. he's very generous with what he shares as well, which I think, um, you know, when you tell someone something private, they're more likely to tell you something private. And so he engenders that kind of dialogue. Um, Luke was not attached when I came on. Um, I, you know, obviously that was the big part of casting was like, well, who's going to play Bundy, <laughs> right? Um, and Luke, I have always been a fan of his. I've been wanting to work with him and he just popped into my head and we offered him the role through his agents and he turned it down. And I was like, okay, I understand that. And um, I want to talk to him. Like, let's, you know, can I just speak to him? Can I get him to know me and get him to know like my take on the movie? And um, because I can understand why he would turn it down. It's for this, the same reasons why when the script came to me, I was like, another Bundy movie, you know, like, so I related to his um, reluctance. And so we have friends in common. I reached out to him and we met, um, this is right at the beginning of the pandemic. We met in a park and we had a socially distanced walk. We walked for like three hours and we just talked and, um, and then it became really apparent that, you know, we um, we had similar uh, concerns about making another Bundy movie, you know, and we were worried about, you know, what is, are we saying something new? Why are we putting this into the stratosphere, you know? Um, and once I pitched, you know, my vision to him, luckily he was, he was on board yeah. um, because I, I just couldn't, I couldn't envision making it with anybody else. He was so perfect. And I, um, yeah, so I'm so happy I 
I, I strong armed him into doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, a three hour walk through the park sounds like, uh, you know, you, you did something right there. Um, he, he reminds I me. I, I got on my knees and I, I no. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he's an interesting guy. I, I haven't seen a lot of his stuff before seeing this film, but I've seen a few interviews that you guys have done together, at least mm -hmm. the Collider interview back in, uh, when you're Tribeca. Yeah. And, um, he reminds me of the type of guy, almost like a Michael Jordan of acting, where mm -hmm. if you ask Michael Jordan, how do you shoot so many three pointers so accurately? Um, he's probably going to scratch his head and be like, you know, I can't really, <laughs> it's not something I can articulate in words. Yeah. You know, he, he's in that zone of, yeah. he's just so freaking talented, but it, it's not his comfort zone to be saying, all right, this is, you know, this is how I approached the role and this is how I got into character and got past these challenges. Um, he seemed to, to very, kind of struggle. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing I was going to say is <laughs> the, the polar opposite of that is Elijah <laughs> when, sorry, I've got a bunch of wildfire smoke up here up oh. in, in Washington. Um, oh. but with Elijah, he just seems like a natural when it comes to, you know, what is this movie about? And you're like, wow. I mean, he can just deliver. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, oh no, we did, we were doing some press today together and I was like, God, I'd love to have that skill to be so articulate. It sounds so smart and articulate. <laughs> <laughs> he's really good at the interview that Elijah, yeah, he's very, I mean, both of them are very smart and, mm -hmm. uh, and just really good guys and, and both so talented um, you know, for me, I have nothing negative to say about working with either of them. It was just like pure, pure joy. Um, but yeah, Luke is very, um, humble. I mean, they're both humble, but just cause you had asked about Luke, you know, he, he doesn't really like to talk about, I'm, I'm guessing, I can't say this for sure, but I don't think he really likes to talk about his process publicly like that. Um, right. but yeah, he's just so talented and, um, yeah, I mean, you should check out some of his other stuff. I, I really loved him in Sarah Pauly's movie, Take This Waltz. Um, he also had a really great Canadian um, TV show called Slings and Arrows. Hmm. That's, I think it's from the 90s, maybe. But anyway, it's it's very, it's very good with Rachel McAdams. It kind of was their, I think it was one of their first big things they did. Well, that's right. He's um, Canadian. He, yeah, he's Canadian. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. But so, he's, I mean, he just, to me, he also... Um, he has that kind of eighties man look to him. You know, there's a very different form of masculinity and sort of what's considered sexy now from mm. men. Yeah. So then we were, people were, didn't weigh as much, you know, there wasn't so much of a, like liking this big hulky kind of male thing. It was more, right. you know, men were not as, as into pumping up their upper body as they are now. Right. Um, so it was a different look. It was a lankier look. And Bundy had that he was tall and thin and Lucas tall and thin. And, um, and and the way Luke sits to me as well, like his just his natural kind of body, sort of a fluidity um, mm -hmm. that he has, that was also very of the time period for you know. So that was another thing that I really liked about about him is that he felt very um, vintage. Is that the mm -hmm. right word? You know, yeah, he yeah. Felt, he he does. Yeah. I, I didn't think about that when I was watching it, but it makes sense now. I did notice though that the the period it is a period piece because you see, yeah. and I it was like, was the fact I went to high school between eighty six and ninety, so I was like, really was I dressed that like this? This is embarrassing. <laughs> so you look like, well, you probably yeah. weren't wearing a prison uniform. You probably weren't. No, wearing no, <laughs> not it. But just everybody else, you know, the detectives and, you know, the camera yeah. crews and, and all the other characters, just really bad. I love not a good 80s. era. <laughs> oh, really? I love it. I'm totally 80s. Like, I, I still have 80s clothes. that They were my mom. My mom saved a lot of her clothes from the 80s, and I'm so happy that she saved them. Oh, nice. So, so they're yeah. coming back then, or they never oh, went out of style? Oh, I think been back for a while. Yeah, high-waisted jeans and acid wash and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So what about Richard Patrick? I, um, I interviewed, um, uh, or, or Rob, Rob, Robert, the reason I say Richard is I interviewed, uh, Richard Patrick, his, his brother, who's in the band filter, um, a couple of years ago. And he was talking about his brother, Robert and, um, their relationship. Oh, yeah, his brother. Oh, yeah. 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 His little brother is a big, you know, rock star, but 
Um, so what, what were your thoughts about casting Robert and his, he, you know, he, I was expecting because he's, he's kind of a bad guy, you know, or at least a really Terminator macho, yeah. <laughs> you know, macho plays a lot of, um, big, bad villain types. Um, you know, what, what were your thoughts with casting him? And, and I was surprised by the soft touch that he had in this film. He would, well, he was also just a joy to work with. It's funny. So, uh, you know, uh, with him, you know, he doesn't audition, you know, there are actors that get to the level they don't audition really anymore. So it was an offer. And I had just been a fan of his, you know, I, again, like I knew his work and I, I had been a fan of his, so I offered him the part. And then <laughs> so I don't think he'll mind me saying this. He, you know, you have to ask the actors, like, can you just send a, a photo of what you look like right now? And especially because it was pandemic times, no one had cut their hair in like eight months, you know, so everyone had these long beards and long hair and we need, you know, costumes, hair and makeup. They need to know what do they look like? Do I need to plan time for a haircut? You know, or have they gained weight? Have they lost weight? So they send an image and, and Robert sent these shots of himself and he's, <laughs> he's wearing no shirt, <laughs> a, like a bike, a leather biker jacket. Yeah. like tattoos and, and he's just like looking at the camera. Can we swear on this podcast? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, he was looking at the camera like, you know, fuck you. Like, I'm like, you know, and I, and I went, Oh shit, what have I got myself into with this guy? And then um, he shows up and, uh, and he's just lovely and really fun to work with. And he was, uh, you know, really game to try anything and, and, and do things, you know, I, because so much of the movie is the two leads sitting in a room with nothing in their hands, talking to each other. And then a lot, and then the second biggest part of the movie is uh, Bill talking to Robert Patrick's character, his boss, in in a room, not doing anything. And I thought, I got to have one actor doing something at some point, you know. So I would throw these things at Robert. I was like, you know what? You're you're a guy who's con you're fastidious about your looks. You you're flossing your teeth, you're shining your shoes, you know. And he was like, oh, this is great, I love it, you know. So he was really um, game to try try yeah. anything. I'm really really fun, big big personality. But I'll never forget when he sent out texted me that image, and I was like, oh wow, this is <laughs> this is not who I thought he was. <laughs> yeah, but, his, th that's yeah. exactly the way his brother Richard described him. He, he, he just, <laughs> you know, Richard's a, I think, uh, a little bit younger than Robert, and said, yeah, he, you know, he wear, he's actually in a biker gang in, yeah. you know, in, in California, uh, drives, you know, a Harley and wears all the leather and everything, and yeah. you know, Richard is just very, he's just like in awe of his brother and uh, probably a little intimidated too. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. he's oh, got no. beat up I a few times. I was a little like, him. oh god. I'm like, uh, just, should I be scared of him? But he was a sweetheart. He was, um, yeah, no, he was great. But yeah, I, I was trying to figure out what the biker gang was. I was like, is this a religious biker gang? Like I was trying to figure out what it was. I never <laughs> did figure it out. So I have to ask him. <laughs> I, he'd probably have to kill you if he told you. So I know he might. So maybe I won't, I won't ask him. <laughs> so the, the writer, um, Kit Lesser, which is a pseudonym, I, I guess, for C. Robert Cargill, who wrote Dr. Strange, Sinister, and Sinister 2. Um, do you have any insight into why he used a pseudonym for writing this script? You know, I don't. I mean, I, I'm I'm a big fan of his, whatever name he uses. You know, I really, I, I like him and um, I like his writing. I think that, um, I mean, he should, you know, he, he, he would know better than me. I think it was just creative differences. You know, and I think that, you know, he has a brand and, um, you know, uh, maybe this one didn't fit into that, but that's just me guessing. I don't know. But all I know is I'm a fan of his and and we get along great. And, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. It's creative differences. Oh, OK. Yeah. I, I'm always curious. You know, I, I talk about Hollywood being kind of a black box in terms of, you know, really what goes on behind the scenes and who's pulling the strings. And, and it's, it's just fascinating to me when, um, you know, you see, you, you have to do a little more digging to see who did the, the writing. And then it was pretty easy to, um, to find out that it was a pseudonym, but yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a fan of his too. And, and, but I think his other work, his work that he writes under his, his, you know, real name is so different from this film. It, it kind of made sense to you don't have a I mean, I can understand it because I, you know, in a previous career, I, I was an audiobook uh, like performer. I was the voice of, of many audiobooks, and I I did a lot of young, you know, Y YA young adult and kids audiobooks, and I I had kind of got myself known in that world. And then I started getting offered these um, kind of Fifty Shades of Grey esque, you know, mm. more sort of pure. And I was like, 
ah, I don't really want that, you know, the audience that knows me as reading The Princess Diaries to suddenly, you know, because I just, it felt like it was sort of two different audiences and camps. And so I did all the other adult mature stuff under a pseudonym. Hmm. You know, I think that, you know, we have to all be aware of our our brand and and what it is we're trying to say. And I think there's so often creative differences in, in movies and, um, you know, how we do things. And, um, you know, and it's, I think it's, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker who also writes and there's, you know, there's stuff that I added to the script, you know, and, uh, and I can completely, you know, I just, I respect him. I respect his choice and um, yeah, no, there's no, um, no drama. Yeah. Well, um, I appreciate you sharing what you did about it. I know, you know, sometimes it's sensitive stuff that you don't want to want to share, but uh, I know I I appreciate that type of candor. Um, I'm always very honest and probably too honest sometimes. (laughs) So I watched No Light and No Land Anywhere last night um, just to get a sense of your other work. And and, uh, I was, you know, I, I have to admit that when I read the premise of the film, I was, I was like, okay, how artsy is this movie going to be? <laughs> you know, how contemplative is it going to be? And IE boring, um, yeah. you know, because I, I don't know, I, I think our attention spans have really suffered in the last 10 years with devices oh, and, you know, yeah. just, we need to be entertained, but I really enjoyed this film. Um, I, I think it just, it has so many surprises in it. Um, I think the only surprise, the, the only thing that really wasn't a surprise was the meeting with her dad and how that was, I think everybody kind of knew where that was going. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That's my real dad, by the way. <laughs> are, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah, he did, he did a great job. Yeah. So, so yeah. matter of fact yeah. about his, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, um, he's not an actor, but, uh, you know, there were so many things that kind of worked out because he's British yeah. and he had come over to the U.S. And so that was kind of perfect that he had, that, you know, and he's very um, emotionally like he doesn't like talking about emotions, my dad at all. And I was like, he, he's going to be perfect at this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was pretty fun. to. I, I think it was maybe a little traumatizing for him <laughs> to play that part. But, yeah, no, I mean, I think. um well, thank you for watching the film. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I think that anyone who had seen any of my other films, um, like I think I had said this before about me being kind of an outsider, but I think, you know, I, I wouldn't have been a natural fit to consider, you know, for No right. Man of God. And so that was part of what was so interesting to me was getting to getting to do No Man of God after having done stuff like No Land, no Land Anywhere, which is, you know, as you say, much, much more indie and um, maybe much more in the kind of emotional realm than, than no man of God is. Yeah. It was, it was, I, you know, what I'm always interested in is, um, in films, where is the source of tension and conflict? And I try to identify that because I feel it, but I don't know where it's coming from. And in, in no light and no land anywhere, um, you know, there's, there's multiple sources of tension and conflict. Uh, you know, one is the quest to find her dad, and, mm-hmm. you know, then there's the conflict with the sister or, you know, is that going to be a relationship? Um, but I found the scene and the scenes in the hotel to be like edge of your seat, um, tent, tent scenes. Uh, and I thought they were going to go in a way different direction than they, they did. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. you see this, what, I mean, what you see is like this empowerment happening with her um, where she's like doing something really risky and dangerous, but she's also finding a way to, you know, flip the script in a way so that she's the one who is making these two men feel like, oh my God, yeah. what do we get ourselves into here? I love so, that you, yeah, that's exactly what I was aiming for. So I love that you, because yeah, you know, you go into that scene thinking like, oh shit, what's going to happen to her? Like, you know, and, and, uh, and then it was really important to me that, that, that scene be about that transfer of power mm-hmm. essentially, you know? Yeah, that was great. And yeah. with, uh, no man of God, the, the, the source of tension for me at least was just the deadline. I mean, the, the due date or the expiration date of Ted Bundy and, 
this information that Hagmeyer was trying to get. It's yeah, it's, it, gonna, yeah. it's just a brilliant, um, a brilliant mechanism, I think, to create tension where, as opposed to my dinner with Andre, <laughs> where's the tension? In that? <laughs> <laughs> just the, when's my meal going to come? Or, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I mean, there's nothing, there's no more sense of a ticking clock than a literal ticking clock to your execution, <laughs> you know? And for Hagmeyer, I mean, that was such a, powerful thing I remember asking him like did it haunt you to hear the things that Bundy said to you and and he said no you know what really haunted me was um the times I had to go knock on someone's door and tell them that their daughter was dead or you know or tell them that I you know couldn't find their daughter didn't know what happened to her you know that's the stuff that kept him up at night Mm -hmm. and so that's the tension for Bill is the like I want to get this information there are families there who want answers about their their child you know yeah and um and it that that really um, for him, those were really high stakes, you know, um, because that was the literal stuff that kept him up at night. Well, I normally, I try to get into a little bit of your artistic journey into, um, the, into film. And so if you have a couple of minutes, I, I, I really don't, I feel badly that you haven't eaten all day and it's the end of the day. Oh no, it's okay. I shoved a bunch of crackers in my mouth before. So that <laughs> they've settled in. I'm not dizzy anymore. <laughs> So, but I'll try to abbreviate my questions a little bit. So you, I understand you, you were born in England yeah, and yeah. raised in Santa Fe, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So what, at what age did you move to Santa Fe? Three. Three. It's so, just before three. Yeah. So you probably from a, I guess from a, a formation standpoint, I would imagine you didn't bring anything with you from England that was formative because you were so young. Well, my dad, my dad, he's British. <laughs> uh, that's true. But but no, yeah. I mean, although I, I went back to England, so I went to get a master's degree. I went to drama school in England and then stayed there for another seven or eight years. Mm. And so, and that was like my, you know, my twenties. Um, and so it it was really formative for me actually as an artist um, as, and as a filmmaker, cause I, I work, yeah, to go back. And because that's really kind of where I found my voice and how I, how I found, how I write and how I create. And it's really where I discovered that I was a director. Mm. I didn't know that I kind of, I mean, I didn't have any um, mo- role models of female directors before. I didn't know really. I mean, I knew theoretically that women could be directors, but all the famous directors that I knew were men. And, um, and then when I went to England, I was working with a theater company called Shunt, and we would do what's called Devise Theater, um, where we all would write and perform and, you know, do lighting and everything. And I started doing these performance art pieces alongside video art. And then I got more and more interested in the video art. And then from there, I produced and acted in a short film. And then from there, I was like, I want to make, I, I was also inspired by the dogma film movement that was going on in Europe at the time. Um, and from there, I was like, I want to make a feature and I want to, you know, like, it doesn't have to be a million dollars. I can just do like a ragtag DIY thing where I, you know, grab a camera and my friends and we shot in a friend's apartment and I made this feature. Um, and I didn't know at the time in the U S the kind of mumblecore movement was happening. Um, you know, I mean, there've been many movements of this kind of DIY aesthetic. Right. Um, but that's what sucked me in. And then I just fell in love with the whole process. And, um, yeah, from there, I was really like, it was a very organic transition into being a director, but England, did, sorry, answer your question, rambling, yeah. but yeah, England, England was formative, just not when I was three, it was more yeah. formative when I was 20. And then growing up in Santa Fe, I mean, that you can't get any more artsy than in Santa Fe. I mean, that town is just filled with creatives and I mean, yeah. it's, it'd be hard not to, um, to have some of that rub off on you growing up in that community. I've, I've been to Santa Fe a few times. I love it there. I love it. I'm trying to convince my husband to I'm like, can we move to Santa Fe? Um, yeah, I, I, Santa Fe is so special to me. I mean, the sky and the mountains, like, you know, it's just, they're one of a kind, so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I was always interested in theater and performance and I have parents who have always been, you know, um, artistic in some way. Both my parents were photographers. My dad used to be in a band, he was a singer and, and he's written poetry and, uh, he was a writer and my mom also was a photographer and she was a theatrical producer. And so they always just were, you know, a supporter and a lover of the arts. Um, and so they were totally happy when I was about five or six, uh, you know, 
I started getting interested in performing. It was like the first time where I felt like I did anything good or that I was good at anything. It was the first time I got attention from grownups at being like good at something, you know? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I guess I was just attention seeking or whatever. And then I, I got into it. My parents always kept me in theater and yeah, I always knew that I wanted to be involved in, in um, the telling of stories. Yeah. Well, I think you found, um, you know, a perfect fit in terms of exactly where you should be because this film was so well executed. It's a beautiful film. Uh, so kudos to your cinematographer. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, I just, I love hearing the origin stories of, you know, how people find their passion and, and, uh, thank you for sharing about that. So if you were to, I I know it's, it's changed so much over the years in terms of how you get into the business. Uh, now people are making content on their phones and they're being seen that way on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. Um, and the, you know, the old route used to be, you know, you moved to Los Angeles, you become a production assistant or, uh, you know, an intern, then a production assistant, then a writer's assistant. And, you know, you kind of work your way up that way, or you go to film school or art school. What, what advice do you have for young people now? And especially young women, um, who want to get into film and either act direct or write or all three. Well, first, I just want to say that I want to encourage old women to get into this business. I don't oh. think we have a 50, 60, 70 year old women <laughs> making movies. I'd love some of them to start. That would be cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, to young people starting out, I mean, I think actually the most important thing is not really to do with the industry. It's more to do with like the quality of your life. You know, this is a rough industry. There's a lot of criticism. There's a lot of rejection. Um, there's a lot of like, you, no, you don't have enough money. No, you can't have that. No, you can't do that. And so it's really important that you foster like a healthy life experience uh, surrounding your, your work life, you know, that you have friendships and relationships and a home life that is, um, uh, that enriches you and that feels good. You have somewhere nice and soft to land at the end of the day. So that's something I always try to recommend. And then um, the other thing is, is that there's just no one path, you know, as you said, you know, now with TikTok and, and YouTube and, you know, people are doing their own thing any which way. And you can make it work by, like you said, becoming an agent's assistant and working your way up, or you can make it work by just posting videos on TikTok. And there's just no one answer. It's really like, you just have to find your own path and, um, and just keep going because mm-hmm. as I said, there's going to be so much rejection. And you just have to keep going despite that. And it can be quite painful at times. Um, I mean, you know, nobody likes harsh criticism, I don't think. Um, and, but you just gotta, I don't know. Like, I think that if it does, if you, if you, if you want to stop, that's great. And you stop, but there are people and that I consider myself one of them that just like the desire to tell stories and the way that they connect to humanity and even the earth is, is through creating art. And, um, my child's coming in. Um, and so, you know, for me, that's just how it is. And it's, it's always going to be that way, whether I'm, uh, whether I'm writing or acting or directing, you know, to me, it's, it's the way I connect to other humans and the way I feel like, um, in a sense, it's like a way out of my, of depression. It's like, I feel most alive when I feel like I'm understanding someone else's story or sharing my story with them. You know, that's when I feel like life is most worth living. Nice. That's nice. Very well here, but uh. well put. And I like your comment about older women and just older people in general getting getting into the industry because I know that there's a lot of creators out there that don't start until their 30s or 40s. And Lynn Shelton was one of those creators. I don't think she started, I think she might have been. I don't know, 40 before she made her first feature, or maybe it was 35 or something like that. But I know she got started later than a lot of um, directors. Yeah, she, so sad about her passing. She was um, an acquaintance of mine. Um, yeah, she. I, I love Lynn and her work. Um, I don't know how old she was when she first started. But yeah, I mean, I think our industry is a little bit too obsessed with the sort of young newcomer. You know, you always hear the story of the 22-year-old, and it's always a boy. 22 year old boy straight out of school who wrote this fantastic script and makes an amazing movie. And sure, it's an amazing movie, you know, but 
to me, that's that that's an old that's a trope now. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I know about the 22 year old cool with boy. You know, I don't know about the 22 year old girl who makes an amazing movie. And I certainly don't know about the 60 year old woman who makes an amazing first movie. You know, mm-hmm. those are the mm-hmm. stories that to me, at least are interesting and, and new. And I wish that our industry had more um, grants and programs that were aimed at finding older story storytellers, um, because I think we have so much to support the first time filmmaker and the young filmmaker. And, uh, you know, it's the young filmmaker, you know, first of all, they're probably living in an apartment that's like, I don't know, 500 bucks a month. You know, they don't have obligations like rent and health care and stuff, you know, to worry about. Um, and it's, you know, old, it's, I think it, it's much harder for older people to break into a new industry than it is for, for young people, you know, mm-hmm. who can just live on canned beans, you know, and don't have kids to support. Right. And then what, where is, is there a resource for people to go to and see what grants are available, what opportunities like Sundance labs are available, or do you have to just Google it and just search around and compile those resources yourself? Unfortunately, it's the latter. Yeah, you just they're they're everywhere. I mean, Sundance certainly has on their website all of their programs, but there's New York Women in Film. They have a female over 40 writing grant. Um, there's ton, there are tons of different, but yeah, unfortunately, there's not, you know, certain friends of mine sometimes will make like a Google Drive and compile, but they also change. You know, there'll be a grant that's available for like five years and then the money runs out and it's not available. And so unfortunately, you do have to just individually Google. You know, and I would recommend Googling, like, you know, if you're a, you know, queer Jewish person from Wisconsin, like Google that because there might be a local Wisconsin grant, you know. Mm. Um, So, yeah, there's there's um, there are a lot of different things out there, but you kind of have to do, unfortunately, do the research. One one last question. Uh, Short films. How important are short films on a person's resume or in their repertoire for showing what they can do versus a script or some other type of, you know, um, work product that showcases what they can do. I see there's just so many short films out there and now they have short festivals at the Aspen short fest and Mm -hmm. all over the country. You're seeing that, but it costs money to do it. It's a lot of effort. I mean, it takes, you know, a whole crew of people to, just like a regular film, except it's shorter. So how important are short films right now for people that are trying to break in? Well, that's a good question. I'm just going to step sideways for a second and just say that what, you know, because you're, when you said that costs a lot of money, it reminded me that is another issue with this industry is, is oftentimes people who have family money and can afford to pay for their first feature or pay for their first short, you know, those people have a huge leg up because they can just, you know, they can ask their parent or their cousin or whatever, hey, can you loan me $200,000 or whatever it is to make this movie? And so um, that part also really sucks, you know, that people from uh, less, you know, not having as padded of wallets, you know, uh, have to work their way up the ladder in a different way, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, But to answer your question, how important are short films? I mean, I don't totally know. I'm not a short film person. Again, I stand by what I said before that there's not one path, you know, for some people, they made 20 short films and then they got a huge feature and that's great. And for some people, they make no short films and just started out making feature. And, you know, so again, it really depends. I, um, I like short films, but I'm not like, a. am not totally, I'm much more, my mind is much more feature. Like I, as you can see, I like to talk a lot. <laughs> ramble on. So my mind really goes like to the long form Um, stories. Now, the only reason why I did a short was because I participated in the um, AFI, the American Film Institute's directing workshop for women. And in in that program, you have to make a short film. And so I took a feature script that I'd written and I just kind of chopped it up and put some scenes together and, you know, sent that for my submission. And then I got in. And so then I, um, I made that short film, which was how does it start my, my film, which was at Sundance two years ago. Um, But I still am going to make the feature of that. Um, you know, I mean, certainly my getting into Sundance really helped my career. Um, but I don't like it would have helped even more had I made a feature that got into Sundance. Right. Um, so I don't know. I just think it's like go with the stories that are, you know, that are yearning to come out of you, whether they're shorts or features. I made a feature first. I, I made three features before I made a short. Mm-hmm. And, and um, so yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny that well, the difference between short films and features is, uh, in in my experience, talking to filmmakers is very spot on. I, I interviewed an Oscar winning film director, Raika Zetabchi, who directed period, uh, <coughs> excuse me, period end of sentence, which was a, um, like a 22 minute film. It, it was on Netflix and it was about the, um, d basically uh, delivering, um, feminine hygiene products to rural yes. villages in India. Yeah. 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 And, uh, Raika produced and directed that film with her boyfriend, Sam, and, they won an Oscar for it. Um, and they, they were joking. I, I interviewed them twice, but they were joking about, you know, the difference between the short film folks and the feature film folks is basically, you know, the short film folks after the Oscar ceremony are getting into a Honda Civic that they, you know, <laughs> that they did not valet park. <laughs> and, you know, there's, it's, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's, it, yes, you get that in that rec recognition sometimes, um, if you're lucky, but, yeah, it's it's tough with a short film to really be heard and seen and taken seriously, um, in a in a larger sense, in a in a you know, in a sense that you're actually going to break into Hollywood. You know, I mean, I think you know, I mean, it's almost sort of like what Quibi tried to do, right? It's like these short little little bites. Um, I think for whatever reason, mainstream audiences are not yet tapped into watching short films on a regular basis. Right. Uh, and I don't know if that's a marketing issue or like a plat you know, platform issue. I mean, you know, with Quibi, I, I don't think they, I think it was all new content, but I, um, I wonder what would have happened if they put a bunch of short films up on there. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, I mean, I, I tend to watch them. If my friends make a short film, I'll watch yeah. them. But, um, but yeah, they're harder to find uh, usually because, I mean, I, it, I think from a business standpoint, it's shorter. People are not going to maybe pay as much money to buy it. So then therefore distributors are not going to put as much money into the marketing of them, you know? So I don't know where the sort of break in the chain happens, but I, certainly, I mean, there are amazing short films out there. Amazing. You know, and I wish that I could see more of them because I, you know, I, I don't, I think there are, um, really cool platforms that have them and and sadly we're also used to just like you know netflix hbo you know whatever the platforms that are just right there on our tv and watching mm -hmm. those it it takes as you said you know our attention span to change to switch to a slightly different platform but maybe watching short films all the time would be bad for our attention spans because yeah. you know it's already well, hard enough through a two-hour movie let alone a three-hour movie you know? i think i think what's really hard about short films is uh, and this question <laughs> turned into a, a long, long uh, uh, colloquy <laughs> here. So sorry about that. But awesome. you know, my my observation about short films is it's really hard to make a good one, like mm. a one that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a resolution, like most narrative films have, and you know, fe or feature length films, I should say, and. Um, so that's hard to do. Plus they're new filmmakers by definition almost. So, you know, that, that's a challenge to put, to put it together in a way that's really going to resonate with audiences. But I think legally too, I, I interviewed a um, director of a short film. Her name is Jess Brunetto and she's a film editor um, by day, but she cobbled together a crew and some money and put in, and uh, Sarah Burns is in it. Uh, it's called sisters, but she made it into um, South by Southwest and a bunch right. of other film f festivals. And it's great. It is a great film. And I was like, how can you watch this? And I think, I think it was like, there was MailChimp sponsored something where you could watch these films, um, on their website or something for a limited time. And you know, yeah. Ma MailChimp, how do I, <laughs> there needs to be a, there needs to be a platform. And, um, I think I was interviewing the, uh, director of the Aspen Short Fest and uh, Susan Rubel is her name. And I said, you know, why don't they create a Netflix called Short Flix? Just, yeah. you know, just have. Did she say that was Quibi? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She just said, whatever, whatever. Go, go raise the funding and do it, Brian. <laughs> Netflix could have it. They could just have a channel, you know. I mean, it's some, you know, like Disney Plus has that going. They have a lot of, you know, all the Pixar shorts. My kids love watching those. Oh, those you know? are great. Those are great. Yeah. So it's like, I, you just have to make it easy for, for people to get them and yeah. find them. Mm -hmm. 
But yeah, I mean, well, I want you to watch my short and tell and next time we talk, you can tell me it's called How Does It Start? How does it start? Okay. I'll have I'll have Emma send you it's just on Vimeo, you know, Vimeo stuff picks or something. Um okay. I'll have her send you the link and you can see. I you look can, forward no to seeing worries it. If you don't. <laughs> no, I will absolutely watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you ask me to. So <laughs> Amber Seeley, thank you so much for talking to me about the movie, No Man of God, and sharing your story with us. Thank you. It was really, really fun. Thanks, Brian. Oh, what, you know, I didn't ask, is it a theatrically released movie and when it will it be available for video on demand? Yeah, it's coming out tomorrow uh, okay. and it is a theatrically released movie. It's playing in, God, 10, I think 10 or 12 cities starting tomorrow. Um, and, and it is also, it's what's called day and date. So it's also going to be available because of the pandemic. We wanted to make sure people who like me like to stay home during the pandemic. Um, so it's also going to be on, you know, iTunes and Amazon and Vudu, Roku, you know, all the places where you can oh, buy. Great. Fantastic. All, all this, yeah. Well, when this launches, I'm going to put in the show notes, all of the links to where they can go watch the movie and your social media contacts and, um, so thanks again and, uh, good luck with the uh, premiere of this movie. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at dreampathpod. And as always, go find your dream path.